Hey heroes, welcome to another amazing episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is sponsored in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to contribute and vote in monthly polls that help decide what topics get covered on the channel, then you can sign up for an amount of your choosing over at patreon.com slash marymarvelite. The link is in the description below along with other places you can find me. This week we are beginning what may be the first installment of a regular ongoing series in which we examine and summarize the history of one of Marvel's most famous heroes. It's the spectacular, the sensational, the amazing Spider-Man. But first, let's jump back in time and look at some of his family history. For example, did you know that his maternal grandfather, William Fitzpatrick, briefly worked with the invaders during World War II? Wild Will, as he was called, provided Captain America, the Submariner, and the Human Torch with intelligence regarding the notorious Nazi Baron Wolfgang von Strucker and his organization Hydra. That aside, let's look at Mae Riley, a beautiful blonde woman who was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Not long after turning 18, May accompanied her best friend Shirley Rosenbaum on a trip to Atlantic City. The primary purpose of this vacation was for Shirley to visit her boyfriend, Harvey Goldberg, who she hadn't seen since he enrolled in the army and left for basic training. But it was through Harvey that May met a fellow Brooklynite named Benjamin Parker. The two went dancing and spent the weekend together, but fell out of contact when Ben was shipped overseas. After that, still living in times of economic hardship, May found herself attracted to a seemingly wealthy man named Johnny Jerome. He treated her to fine dining and took her out dancing on multiple occasions, during one of which May heard a familiar voice. Up on the bandstand was Ben Parker, singing the same song from their first dance two years prior. May was unable to face Ben at the time, but ran into him a month later while he was working as a carnival barker. He tried to warn her that Jerome was nothing more than a criminal, but she dismissed his protests as petty jealousy. Things soon came to a head when Jerome hastily tried to convince May to elope with him. She was naturally hesitant, and Ben soon arrived to reveal that Johnny had robbed a jewelry store and was on the run. After May rejected him, Jerome tried to make his escape, but was soon captured by the police. Ben remained there for May, and in time, the two started a relationship. They worked different jobs to support one another, and Ben eventually found success as a salesman in the textile industry. They often had to look after Ben's kid brother, Richard, which initially soured May on the idea of having children of her own. Years passed, and Ben started thinking about marriage, but May could tell that he was too nervous to ask. After a month of this, May had Richard come along on one of their dates so that he could play their song on the jukebox, giving Ben the confidence to propose. The two married, with Richard serving as Ben's best man, and the newlywed couple moved to the quiet neighborhood of Forest Hills in Queens. Having warmed up to the idea of having a child, May and Ben decided to add a new member to the family. However, their child didn't make it to term, and due to medical complications, Applications, they were unable to ever try again. Meanwhile, Richard Parker grew up and followed his big brother's example by enlisting in the U.S. Army, albeit by lying about his age. He went on to serve a tour of duty with the Special Forces before being recruited into the CIA by one Colonel Nicholas Fury. There, he met a beautiful translator by the name of Mary Fitzpatrick. As alluded to earlier, she was the daughter of the legendary OSS operative Wild Will Fitzpatrick. Her mother passed away when she was young, but William saw to it that Mary went to the best schools he could afford. When Will passed away as well, he wasn't able to leave his daughter much money, but her education and connections landed her a job as a translator in the CIA, where she met Richard Parker. Mary longed to work in the field, and with Richard's help, she was able to do so. The two fell in love, and while Mary didn't have any remaining family of her own, she soon found a new one with the Parkers when she married Richard. Of course, Ben and May were unaware 
aware of the dangerous work that Richard and Mary really did for a living. For example, on one mission, the couple rescued the mutant Canadian operative Logan from Hydra and Baron Strucker. Upon returning from that, they received the news that Mary Parker was pregnant and Logan congratulated Richard before departing. Eight months later, Peter Benjamin Parker was born, much to the joy of the entire family. Before long, Richard and Mary were called back into active duty and left Peter with May and Ben while embarking on a mission in Algeria. Their job was to infiltrate a criminal organization being run by Albert Malik, a Soviet agent who had usurped the costume and identity of the Red Skull. The real Skull, of course, had been missing since the end of World War II, but Malik discovered that Richard Parker was a double agent and dispatched his operative, Carl Fears, the finisher, to eliminate him. Richard and Mary's plane was sabotaged and evidence was planted that framed the Parkers for treason against the United States. May and Ben were devastated by the news and decided that they would never tell Peter what happened to his parents. Becoming the boy's legal guardians, they raised him and although it wasn't always easy for the older couple, they loved him like a son. As Peter grew, it quickly became clear that he was academically gifted, with a natural aptitude for science. He excelled in his classes at Midtown High, which is admittedly a peculiar name for a school located in Queens. However, he was also timid and socially awkward, causing him to be excluded and mocked by his classmates. Notable among them was Flash Thompson, a jock who garnered attention from girls and bullied Peter. Other students at Midtown High included Liz Allen, Tiny McKeever, Jason Ionello, and Sally Avril. There was a girl named Jessica Campbell who had a crush on Peter, but ironically he never noticed her and she was too shy to talk to him. In any event, things really get started when Peter attended a public science exhibit which was being conducted by Dr. Eric Schwinner from General Tektronics. During a demonstration on the handling of radioactivity, a common house spider descended on its web and was struck by a particle beam generated by an isotope genome accelerator. Shocked and in pain, the irradiated arachnid was jolted from the beam and landed on Peter Parker's hand. Unnoticed by anyone else, the spider instinctively bit Peter shortly before the radiation claimed its life. Dazed and lightheaded, Peter wandered out onto the street but felt as though his body was charged with some sort of fantastic energy. He was harassed by a pair of street thugs but shocked at his own strength when he pushed one of them back. Running away, he was almost struck by a car but leapt out of the way and clung to the side of a building. He effortlessly scaled the sheer surface, inadvertently crushing a steel pipe in his grip when he reached the top. The only one who saw this was a young boy who was walking with his mother, but of course, she didn't believe him. Peter was ultimately left with the unmistakable conclusion that he had been altered by the spider's bite, endowing him with proportional powers. Now, we won't go too in-depth on these today, but there have been some proposed explanations as to how this happened. For example, the cosmic entities Master Order and Lord Chaos once claimed responsibility for orchestrating these events. Much later, a man named Ezekiel Sims, who'd attained similar powers through mystical means, insisted that there was a totemic aspect to Peter's transformation, and that the spider's bite was no mere accident. However, believe me, that is a whole other can of worms that we will worry about another day. There are also other stories involving the same radioactive spider, which I'll briefly mention here. Notably, after it bit Peter, but before dying, it also bit a girl named Cindy Moon, endowing her with similar abilities as well. It was evidently found by the scientists and kept for study, but we'll come back around to that a little bit later in the video. In the meantime, let's turn our attention back to our protagonist, Peter Parker. The same day he was bitten, he came upon a wrestler named Crusher Hogan, who was offering a cash prize to anyone who could last three minutes minutes in the ring with him. Donning a makeshift costume, Peter decided to enter as a way to test his abilities. And sure enough, the mysterious masked Marvel easily overpowered his larger opponent. 
More importantly, the whole thing was witnessed by a talent agent by the name of Maxie Schiffman. And shortly after, he offered Peter the opportunity to appear on television as a masked performer. Excited by the idea, Peter secretly began working on a new costume, hiding his abilities from his aunt and uncle. Furthermore, it just so happens that he had been studying multi-polymer adhesive compounds, which led him to an idea. Adapting a formula of his own design, he created a pair of wrist-mounted devices, allowing him to shoot his own kind of webbing. Not long after that, on a television variety program being filmed at the Ed Sullivan Theater, the world was introduced to the amazing Spider-Man. However, because of the way he'd been treated as a timid teenager, Peter Parker felt indifferent to the world at large. And so when a thief ran past him following his television debut, he made no effort to stop him. Instead, he simply went home to the only people he really cared about, his Aunt May and Uncle Ben. Things proceeded smoothly for a while, with Spider-Man's sensational performances captivating the entire country. But then one evening, he returned to Forest Hills to find a police car outside the Parker residence. He was horrified to learn that his home had been burglarized and that the culprit had shot and killed his Uncle Ben. The officer assured him that the burglar was trapped in a waterfront warehouse and would soon be caught, but Peter wasn't willing to wait. In a blind rage, he donned his Spider-Man costume and headed to the waterfront himself, using his web line to swing across the city for the first time. Reaching the warehouse, Spider-Man quickly defeated the burglar, only to be met with a devastating revelation. The man who'd killed the uncle who raised him was the very same man he could have stopped back at the TV studio, but chose not to. Leaving the unconscious burglar for the police, Peter disappeared into the night, having learned the harsh lesson that with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Now, that story is one that many of you are familiar with, and so let's look at some additional details that have been added since its original telling. For example, the night that Ben was killed, May was looked after by her next-door neighbor, Anna Watson. Anna's niece, Mary Jane, was visiting at the time, and so she was watching from the window when Peter Parker came home. Seeing Peter rush into the house only for Spider-Man to emerge from the window moments later, Mary Jane Watson quickly deduced the truth. She wasn't the only one who figured out that Peter Parker was Spider-Man, so let's take a moment to talk about Carl King. Carl was one of the students who bullied Peter, and a particularly nasty one. He followed Peter to the public science exhibit and actually saw him being bitten by the radioactive spider. Over the following days, he continued to watch and learned what Peter could do. Growing jealous and wanting powers of his own, Carl returned to the science lab and found the remains of the radioactive spider. With the spider dead and Carl having no idea how to replicate the accident, he simply ate the arachnid and hoped for the best. This, however, caused his body's internal organs to be replaced with a colony of spiders that absorbed his consciousness. Furthermore, he found that he could grow stronger by jumping from body to body, consuming the insides of his victims and wearing their skin, which he did to both of his parents. Calling himself The Thousand, he laid low for years, gathering his strength in anticipation of a showdown with Spider-Man. Now, there was another person who followed Peter from Midtown High to the exhibit in radioactivity, the aforementioned Jessica Campbell. She intended on asking him out, but her attempt to get his attention was thwarted by the spider's bite. Not long after that, Jessica lost her entire family in a car accident while she herself spent several months in a coma. She eventually recovered and was adopted by another family, taking their last name to become Jessica Jones. Besides that, one person to witness Peter's victory against Crusher Hogan was a teenage boy named Clayton Cole. 
Recording the match with his phone, Clayton put the video online, garnering a significant number of views. As such, he felt responsible for kickstarting Spider-Man's show business career and was in the live studio audience for his television debut. Inspired by what he saw, he began working on a costumed identity of his own. Now, there are probably other characters and stories that are directly related to Spider-Man's origin, and certainly other details, retcons, and retellings we could mention. I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the whole situation involving Cindy Moon and Ezekiel Sims. At one point, there was even one version of events where the exhibit that Peter attended was hosted by Otto Octavius. That occurred in the book Spider-Man Chapter 1, in which the origins of Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus occurred at the same time. Despite being referenced in the main Spider-Man books of the time, this version of events obviously clashed with established continuity and was ultimately relegated to an alternate timeline. So let's turn our attention back to Peter once again and look at some of his earliest exploits as Spider-Man. As many of you are no doubt aware, the character made his debut in the pages of Amazing Fantasy No. 15 in 1962, before getting his own title, The Amazing Spider-Man, the following year. Well, in 1995, Marvel released three more issues of Amazing Fantasy, 16, 17, and 18, taking place in the gap between the two books. In the first of these stories, a man attempted to convince Aunt May that Ben had purchased an expensive bedroom set before he died. Suspicious, Peter investigated the matter as Spider-Man and uncovered an entire operation targeting elderly widows and widowers with similar scams. This was run by a con man by the name of Conrad Eisenstadt, better known as The Undertaker. Spider-Man confronted The Undertaker and declared his intention to call the police, prompting the villain's men to open fire. This is when Peter first discovered his danger-detecting spider sense, which, when combined with his superhuman speed and agility, allows him to evade speeding bullets, even if he's not exactly faster than one. After exposing the Undertaker's operation, Spider-Man encountered another super-powered teenager, Joey Pulaski. He initially befriended her, but the two clashed when Peter learned that Joey was using her abilities for crime. He attempted to talk her down, but when that failed, he ultimately felt forced to capture her for the police. Because of this, Spider-Man caught the attention of Joey's mysterious employer, Wilson Fisk, the kingpin of crime. Later, wanting to help his aunt out financially, Peter got back into contact with his agent, Maxie Schiffman. He booked him an appearance on the television variety program, It's Amazing! Although the last-minute inclusion bumped a previously booked guest from the show, astronaut John Jameson. During the filming, the show was interrupted by another of Schiffman's clients, Ronnie Hilliard, aka Supercharger. You see, with more and more superhumans emerging, Hilliard's father was a scientist who became fascinated with the idea of endowing people with superpowers. His experiments cost him his life, but inadvertently gave his son electrical abilities. As Supercharger, Hilliard wanted to prove that superhumans were dangerous by killing the studio audience, but was thwarted by Spider-Man. You know, if this does become a regular ongoing video series, it's going to be a long one because we're just now getting to the first issue of Amazing Spider-Man. Spidey continued working with Schiffman, but his refusal to reveal his true identity became an issue when Maxie had to stop paying him under the table. Furthermore, J. Jonah Jameson, the publisher of the Daily Bugle newspaper and Now magazine, turned public opinion against the wall crawler with a series of scathing editorials. Jameson's enmity was of course emboldened by the fact that masked vigilantes took the spotlight away from real heroes like his son, astronaut John Jameson. Even so, Spider-Man was the one to rescue John when an attempt at space launch went awry. Peter expected Jonah to change his tune, but of course the old journalist simply accused Spider-Man of sabotaging the launch in the first place. 
As a result of this relentless media barrage, the masked vigilante was soon wanted by the police. Seeking employment, Spider-Man forced his way into the headquarters of the Fantastic Four, whose activities were approved by the federal government. He demonstrated his own abilities in a brief scuffle, hoping to be hired by the legitimate super team. However, he was informed that the FF operated more like a non-profit organization and weren't exactly interested in hiring known outlaws. Following that, Spider-Man clashed with the Russian Master of Disguise known as the Chameleon. He attempted to frame the wall crawler for his own crimes, but was ultimately caught and arrested. Now, we mentioned earlier that a teenager named Clayton Cole followed Spider-Man's early show business career. Using sonic technology he developed, Cole created a super-powered costume for himself. Calling himself Clash, he decided to hire Spider-Man for a video featuring them both, and met with Maxi Schiffman. Peter was reluctant, but with Cole offering to pay in cash, he agreed to the deal. The costumed pair fought a staged battle across the rooftops, but Clash's sonic powers threatened to do real damage. With his spider sense blaring, Peter cut the battle short and trapped Clash in a layer of webbing. He left with the money, leaving Clash feeling betrayed, disillusioned, and vengeful. Naturally, the two battled several times after this until Cole was defeated and unmasked. Now, before we end off for the week, there's one more person from Spidey's first appearance that I want to address. If you remember, there was a little kid who witnessed Peter Parker scaling the side of a building right after he got his powers. Years later, he realized that the person he saw must have been Spider-Man and decided to cash in by revealing his identity. A police sketch artist drew a rendition based on his remembered description, and the wall crawler's face soon supposedly adorned the front page of the Daily Bugle. Fortunately for Peter, with the amount of time that had passed and the distance that was between him and the kid when he was seen, it's safe to say that nobody would be recognizing him from the sketch. Anyway, that's all I've got for you this week, but obviously we've only just scratched the surface of Spider-Man's long history. I hope you enjoyed this look at his origin and family, and if you want to see more, be sure to let me know in the comments. If and when we do come back to this, we'll likely be picking up the pace a little bit to look at more of Spidey's original adventures, as well as some once untold tales. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching this video, and if you did enjoy it, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and share it on your favorite social media. As always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page where, for only a dollar a month, you can get your name in these special thanks here, and vote in monthly polls that help decide what topics get covered on the channel. But that's all I've got for you this week, and until next time, true believers, Excelsior!